Travers, let's get into it immediately. Why, why this clip? I mean, it's, it's, after 30 years, it remains as violent and perhaps as distasteful. Maybe distasteful, but very funny. And I don't mean in this uh, disgusting male chauvinist way that when a man terrorizes a woman, it's funny. No? I mean in a very precise way. First, what's so interesting is just think about... There seems to be an echo. Yeah. Just think about whose standpoint, point of view is privileged in this scene. You know, around whose gaze, that's what comes to our topic, is this scene constructed, as it were. The obvious answer would have been Kyle MacLachlan, you know, the Twin Peaks guy, who is hidden in the closet observing. Maybe, and here, okay, we can watch this clip in this way. There, this is the obvious way to watch it. And there I would like to draw your attention nonetheless to one or two details. One is that uh, uh, my friend, the French uh, cinema theorist Michel Sion, specialist of voice, gave a wonderfully simple reading of this scene, claiming that we should imagine it as a visual hallucination of a child not watching, observing visually, but, you know, child at a behind the closed door listening to parental intercourse. And that all the weird features are to be understood as visual imaginations of a child who doesn't know what sex is yet and simply tries to imagine it. And this is a wonderful reading of this, you know, the oxygen or whatever it is, mask that she puts on and breathes. The idea is a small boy listens to parental intercourse and hears, okay, I will not imitate it for you, it's too vulgar, but you know the father intensely... But, but, but tell, me, it, tell me, what I'm failing to see for the moment yeah. is what's funny about it. Not yet. Okay. The funny guy is Dennis Hopper, obviously. No? Okay. What I want is, is that it's as if the child then imagine, my God, why is my dad breathing like that? He must have some oxygen mask on or whatever. You know, almost everything can be read in this way. This brings us to first crucial point. We don't have time to develop it. The role of fantasy, and this is the basic lesson of Freud, more actual than ever today. You know, this so-called immature fantasies. Children suspect there is sex, something mysterious. They don't know what it is, and they then try to imagine it. Now, I don't think we ever reach maturity, in the sense that finally you know what is sex, you don't need these dreams. I think that we, huma we humans always need a fantasy. It's never that you say, now I'm fully mature, I know what we are doing, it's just me and my partner, we are doing it. And I remember... And, and, and we need it because? We need it because, okay, now we go into Lacanian legacy, my Lacanian theory, my point would have been because, as Lacan says, il n'y a pas de rapport sexuel. It doesn't work without it. If you want sex, without fantasy. Without fantasy support. It's one of the most painful scenes that I remember. Did you see Michael Haneke's The Piano Teacher? When the young boy and Isabelle Huppert finally do it. And she's just like a dead piece of wood there. You know, sex without any fantasy support. But what I wanted to tell you is to tell you how this works. Two funny details from my youth. I remember when I was, I don't know what, six, seven, of age, I knew vaguely how you do sex, but I didn't know how it functions, how it is connected with uh, producing a child. And then even now I'm proud of them. I had two ideas, I remember. You're, One, you're, you're proud of the ideas you yes, had back the then? Yes, the ideas. Okay. First word was this one. I, uh, I knew that sex has something to do with producing children. But I couldn't accept it, this is, that 
such a disgusting thing, their sweating bodies mingling, how can this produce something so noble as a child? So I said, at the same time, it must be true that we, who are the stupid birds, storks, are really bringing children. And then here came my genius. I invented the theory of how to bring the two together. Let's say What's you the, want the, a the, child. Yeah. You make love to your wife, and a stork is observing you. If the stork likes how you do it, you will get a reward, a child. <laughs> you see, this is creative thinking, you know. Then I had to accept the disgusting fact that nonetheless sperm and so on. And for a couple of years, I have a theory, which is no wonder women who want to suck our life energy of men <laughs> loved it. I had a much crazier theory that to make a child, you have to make love the whole year of pregnancy. You know, like once you make love, you say, darling, today we will produce the ear of our child. Next sex, the, the, <laughs> the hand, the eyes, you know. Isn't this a nice idea? It is a very nice idea. Yeah. You put it into practice. Sorry? You put it into practice. Yeah, and then yeah. I had my first heart attack and so on. Uh, yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. another story. No, quite seriously. What but I try to tell you is that it sex, it's never just the two of us, me, my lover, and what we are doing. The, and sex it, is, is between more than two people, is yeah, what you're yeah. saying. It has to be a fantasy. It has to be. It's all in let's, this let's, sense. Let's try to, to link it to what we saw. Let's try to link it to what we saw and also try ah, to... Now I will do this, but now let's go further. If we want to see this, we should go further. Further, so this is one standpoint. He, Kyle McLachlan, is the one who imagines the scene. And this is the... But more than just imagines, it's stuck. I mean, we yeah, really... Yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 yeah I, but in a way, libidinally. Of course, we accept that within the narrative, it all really happened. You know, you know the line I, I so much like of Blanchot, where he says that fascination is to be touched at a distance, which is very much what's happening here. Absolutely, it must I be mean, a distance, yes, I because mean, if you come close to it, you're no longer fascinating, it's just disgust. Right. You know who was the great master here? Kafka. Remember, in uh, the castle, not the trial, you remember how from below the valley, the castle uh, is magnificent, sublime, blah, blah. But once uh, the geometer, K, okay, the, the guy, uh, almost goes up and almost arrives at the... And all of a sudden he notices these are just small, uh, ugly buildings and so on and so on. And I think, this is the point now about fascination, you know, there is a point of so-called Christian, not only Christian wisdom, to which I'm totally opposed. I'm generally opposed to wisdom. I think wisdom is the most disgusting thing you can imagine. Wisdom is the most conformist thing you can imagine. Wisdom is this, you know, whatever you do, a wise man will come and justify it, you know. Like, you do something risky and you succeed. There will, come, there will be a wise man who will come and say something like, I don't know, we in Slovenia, we have a proverb, maybe you have a similar one, only those who risk profit, and so on, and so on. Let's say you do the same thing, but fail. A wise man will come, and he will say something like, in Slovenia, we had a vulgar saying, which says, you cannot urinate against the wind, or something like that. You know, this is wisdom. Whatever you do, a wise guy will come and... Uh, and wisdom, you know, but, but, I believe, but it's so interesting that a, um, a philosopher should be against wisdom. We all are. I mean, your Kierkegaard knew this. Kierkegaard was anti-wise man par excellence. Wisdom is pagan. Should be liquid. Okay, no, no, not going to my Stalinist stuff. But what I want to do, once <laughs> I made a mental experiment, if you don't believe me. Uh, let's take, I will say something. I will say, I don't know how to say it, I'm too ironic with all this pathos, you know. Why are we, uh, why are we running after these uh, miserable earthly pleasures? Think about eternity. The only satisfaction is eternity. If I were to say it with proper pathos, it would sound a deep thing to say. It, okay. did, it sounded... It now, did. let's yeah. say the opposite. Why run after the specter of eternity? Carpe diem, grasp what you have here. 
It sounds wise. Now I will say the third option. Why be caught in a contrast between eternity and temporary existence? The true wisdom is to see eternity in fleeting temporary pleasures. It is wise. Then I say the fourth variation. We are forever condemned between the two. A wise man accept this. You know, whatever I say, that's my point. You can sell it as a wisdom. This is a wisdom. And if from no one else, from your Kierkegaard, you can learn this, that whatever Jesus Christ was, he wasn't a wise guy. He was a provocative man. It, it reminds me of, of something you've said about Martin Luther King, yeah. that he never used the word tolerant. Yeah, this is, but this is part of my general polemics, yes, against, uh, you know, like, against the all pervasiveness of the term tolerance today. How, this, here you find ideology. Of course, I'm for tolerance in the sense of, I'm not for intolerance. I don't think we should beat uh, women. But, uh, you're, but you're not against real wisdom, or that doesn't exist? There is no real wisdom. Real wisdom is like democratic Stalin, you know. What do you want? <laughs> There is no real wisdom as such has this cheating. But this you should learn from your Kierkegaard, my God. That, or Kierkegaard, how do you, I know. Do you pronounce it differently. Yeah. That, yeah. that, that the basic Christian gesture is this, you know, wager on a crazy, mad decision, you know. But let me go on, nonetheless. So, uh, we have, uh, so, uh, let just, me. I've just never heard anybody rant so powerfully against wisdom. It strikes me as... Are you a Jew or are you a secret pagan? Somewhere in between. Because Let's it, go on. It all, it, all, it all begins, I think, with, with, it all begins with, with, with Old Testament, which is why I always repeat that. The greatest, the, the greatest, the first real book, text on critique of ideology is the book of, how to pronounce it, Job, the guy who got screwed up by God and so on. Can you imagine what an incredible book this is? You know what happens, no? Everything goes wrong for Job, uh, he, he lo loses, and that's how it's written in the Bible. His sheep, his cows, his chicken, his wife, and so on, they come after, you know? So he loses everything, and then ideology enters. You remember, three wise men that you obviously like. But no, I, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, no. Not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that I don't like them anymore. Okay. okay. Three, I mean, you, you, have each of them, you have converted yeah. me. Each of them proposes to Job precisely an ideological formula which gives some meaning to his suffering. No? The first one says, God punished you so you must have done something wrong even if you don't know what, look deeper into yourself. The second one basically says, this is, God is testing you, persists, blah, blah. His suffering has a meaning. And it's interesting if you read it carefully. Job's defense is not, no, I'm an innocent guy. He just cannot accept that this stupid catastrophe, calamity that hit him has any deeper meaning. Then ah, the that, miracle. So, so that's it. Yeah. Then, w wisdom is against yeah. the notion that there is yeah. something containable like deeper yeah, meaning. Yeah, wisdom brings meaning always. You know, wisdom says, oh, you maybe all this suffering seems to you meaningless, but it has a deeper meaning, whatever. But you know what's the miracle then? God comes then, as you know, and says everything that those three idiots said is wrong, everything that Job says, all the complaints are, he was right. That's the first wonderful rehabilitation of critique of ideology. Then it goes even further. Then, just read the Bible. You young people should learn from it. <laughs> then Job nonetheless asks the obvious question. No? But, okay, but nonetheless, why did you screw me up? Why did I suffer? And then comes God's famous answer, you know, that arrogant. Where were you when I created this monster, that, whatever? This is usually read as a simple uh, uh, divine arrogance, like, who are you to talk to me? I'm infinitely above you. Ah, my favorite Catholic theologist, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, gives a wonderful, totally opposite reason. He said that God's answer is really, 
You think your life was a catastrophe, but look at all the creation. It's one great nightmare. I screwed up everything, you know. <laughs> like it's kind of a God's confession. It's all chaos. It's not only you. <laughs> and you see, this is anti-wisdom there. And you, Jews, I say this. Yeah, yeah, with, you know you, it. You say this with affection. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, no, no, seriously, no. let me tell you very short. Another, my favorite story, my Jewish friends, Udi Aloni and others, uh, explain to me this. You know that in Talmud, you have two times the same story. In my new book, you find all the quotes and so on, which is incredible. Two rabbis debate about certain, I don't know which theological point. And I warn you, this is not humor, joke, or blasphemy. This is sacred stuff of, uh, of Jewish tradition. And one who is losing the argument says, wait a minute, why don't we call God to resolve? You know, it's like at the beginning of Woody Allen's, uh, uh, Woody Allen's Any Hall, you know, when they debate uh, Marshall McLuhan, I think, and Marshall yeah, yeah. McLuhan. And then God comes, and before even God starts to answer, the second rabbi, who didn't want to call God, starts to shout at Jehovah. Like, basically, I translate it freely, fuck off, old guy. You created the world, you screwed it up, you did your work, leave it now to us, wise scholars, to debate it. You don't. And you know what then happens? Jehovah says, oh my God, they are right, they are right, and runs away. Uh, this is miracle. This is what I'm talking you know, about. It's so funny. I mean, you, it's so funny. You do should, you know that? I, I don't, but it's so funny. You should mention. It's not a joke. This this story is even told in two versions. But let's drop that. And it's funny that you you mention Woody Allen because I'm thinking that one of your rants against wisdom makes me think that it's a wisdom is too rosy, it's too sweet, it offers consolation. And in some way, you're fighting that. No, no but I think you're fi fighting the notion of consolation. You, you know that line of Woody Allen, where he ends up a stand-up comedy. He does. He says, "I'd like to leave you on a positive note. Will you accept two negatives?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But let's go. Let's go back. No, but for Woody Allen has this anti-wisdom. For example, you yes. know, which is one of his favorite lines for me. Maybe you know it. Like he says, "People can achieve immortality in different ways." through your great deeds, heroic deeds, through your works of art, through your sacrifice. He said, I want to be immortal so that I just don't die. <laughs> I don't want to do those. No, he is good here, although he is sometimes too bright for his own good. Like and he's things. a good reader of Kafka. But now, back to, to what we're yeah. seeing. Because what I would like for you to express here yeah. is why you think... It's comical. Yeah, why Jack? Because I, as you know, I, I interviewed David Lynch not long ago, and one of the things he said is that Jack, for him, is funny. Absolutely. Funny. And that's crucial. Uh, uh, no, though, yeah, though, though yeah, at yeah. the same time, you know, Lynch is very, very careful at never really saying anything that is absolutely meaningful. He's very afraid of attributing meaning to... But here he is, he is, although you know, I am more pro-Christian atheist, here he is deeply Jewish, which, you know, which is for me the ultimate... It, there is in Jewish approach some kind, a way of taking things too literally, which is so subversive. For example, I met at a round table in, I don't know where in Spain, that Israeli writer David Grossman. I think he's too cheaply humanitarian, I don't like him, but he told me something wonderful. He told me that, you know, the, the war of 67, when Arabs were Nasser and they were doing all the threats, we will throw Jews into the sea. He told me, you know what was his reaction, Grossman's? He said, my God, they may come and throw me into the sea and I don't know how to swim. So he enrolled into... Swimming, uh, swimming teacher, whatever lesson, taking swimming lessons and so on. Very is, practical solution. Yeah, isn't yeah. this all about, I think, anyone who wants to know what real Freudian interpretation is against all this Jungian hermeneutic of depths, what Lynch hates, you told me. Well, yeah, he hates, you know, the, there's a line uh, that I want to hmm? quote to you, particularly here hmm? in, in, uh, in Denmark. Hannah Arendt says uh, about Karen Blixen, 
She says, storytelling reveals meaning without committing the error of defining it. And that, to my mind, is very Lynchian. It's yeah, the the, only, my yeah. only problem with Hannah Arendt here is that, like, every... Was she aware? Maybe she was. Don't underestimate her. That uh, every meaning has something undefined. Like, the moment you can define it, it's no longer meaning. You know, like, when, if some of you are proud to be Danes, of Danish nationality. If I ask you, but what does it mean to be Danish? And then you say, oh, way of life, blah, 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 but it's not meaning. Like, the, uh, it's, it's always something, as they say in French, je ne sais quoi. I don't know what. You know, meaning must have this undefined dimension, which is why... Uh, which, which will lead us to certain questions about what identity is and what a person yeah. is. Okay, which, we could go on here we, again we at ideological mechanism, because I think ideology always works like this. Let's take ideology at its most brutal, anti-Semitism. I think that if you just say Jews are greedy, exploitative, uh, cunning, dirty, too hardworking, too intellectual, this is dirty, but it's not yet anti-Semitism proper. Anti-Semitism proper occurs when you turn this around and you say, they are dirty, da, 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 blah, blah, because they are Jewish. And what are they Jews in themselves? We don't know. Some mysterious acts which makes it, you always have this mystery. And I'm so, okay, I will develop this idea briefly, it's a nice one, because this is how, for me, ideology works. Here, within anti-Semitism, the Jew is this... Are we doing anything mm -hmm. wrong? Do you have a phone on you? No, I don't no. have a phone. Let me see. Ha, ha, ha. Is that what it's beeping? Is no, she? now it's off. Okay. He works for NSA. They are listening <laughs> to all of us. <laughs> no, seriously. I, you know, let me tell you briefly a story that maybe some of you know it, but I think it works perfectly. You remember Joss, the movie, where the sharks attack? Now, the wrong question that Lynch was right to have is, what's the meaning of the attacking shark, killing people? And then you can play all possible games. For right-wing interpretation, the shark stands for immigrant threat, third world threat, whatever, attacking ordinary Americans. Then you have left history. Do you know that Fidel Castro admired? Joss Spielberg movie. He said, it's clear to me, shark is a metaphor of big capitalism exploiting small, um, uh, ordinary Americans. But it's wrong here, I hope David Lynch would agree with me, it's totally wrong to press into this direction and ask, but what does it really mean? No, the whole point is that we in, let's say, everyday Americans, in their everyday life, have a whole series of fears. We fear nature, hurricanes, tornadoes. We fear immigrants. We fear the poor. We fear the big banks, and so on. And it is as if, magically, we replace all these fears for one empty symbol, the shark. My point being... So whatever we can catch, as yeah, it were. Yeah, and it's exactly the same with, basically, with anti-Semitism. In the sense of, imagine a German in the late 20s in Germany. He fears financial exploitation, media, sex perversion, whatever. And what Hitler did is to tell him behind all this is a Jew. All these inconsistent fears are exchanged for one big fear, fear of the figure of the Jew, which explains why the figure of the Jew in anti-Semitism, did you notice this, it's crucial, is totally inconsistent. Jews are at the same time lazy exploiting us and working too much. You know, in American University, I encounter even today, they say, he's Jewish, how can we compete with him? We go out, we have a beer, we drink, they work all the night or whatever. Then, Jews are at the same time hyper-intellectual and dirty, don't, you know, this inconsistency. Now, what's the mechanism here? Sorry if I repeat my old jokes, but they work here, I claim. Uh, there is, in Poland, I found it, from socialist times, a wonderful joke, which says, you know, you must just remember that in official communist ideology, communism or socialism was the highest result of entire human history, the synthesis of all that was greatest in 
humanity's achievements. And the story goes like this, the joke. Socialism is a synthesis of all the greatest achievements of human history. From prehistory, it took primitivism. From ancient times, it took slavery. From medieval times, it took domination. From capitalism, it took exploitation. And from socialism, it took the name. <laughs> And my point is that this is anti-Semitism. From the poor people, it takes their poverty, dirty, laziness, whatever we attribute to them. From the rich, it takes exploitation, blah, blah. And from the Jews, it takes the name. Now, I do want to get back to um, Blue Velvet. Okay, let's do it. Second figure, the I father. Want, I, I want to get back yeah, to the it. father. I mean, yeah, the father. Because, you know, you say um, that cinema is the ultimate pervert art. It doesn't give you what you desire, it tells you how to desire. I was too wise when I said that. Okay, I mean, nobody's perfect, it's fine. I but am, but, but now, I now, now, explain, yeah. because there's a, this scene which, yeah. uh, you know, 30 years later is still quite yeah. shocking, it's very perverse in some way. I agree with and, you. And, and there are only a couple of films with that, like, with, with I wonder how, I saw now 50 years later, and Hitchcock's Psycho still works in this way, up yeah. to a point. There are just a few films, okay, go on. Wh why, let me just ask you, why, why, what is it in, maybe you can't say, but what is it in something like that scene I we think saw? maybe I'm but, totally wrong, but what fascinates me, and now I'm coming back yeah. to my point, it's precisely that it's not just the scene that we describe, this gaze observing. Okay, within this perspective, we can even say that what happens in the room may be only the hallucination. The only narrative reality is the guy there in the closet he, uh, Kyle MacLachlan hearing something and imagining it. But we can do the opposite reading, which says maybe he doesn't exist, Kyle MacLachlan. Maybe the only reality is that of disgusting behavior of Dennis Hopper in the room, and how does then Kyle MacLachlan exist? Now we come to the comical side. Uh, what does, how, the only way to account for, it's very simple, primitive reading, but I think it does strike the truth. The only way to account for Dennis Hopper's behavior is that he is not what he appears to be, this brutal, half-raping figure. He is an impotent father who boasts all the time to cover up his Impotence. When he shouts at her, Isabella Rossellini, don't you fucking look at me? Why? Because he's impotent, nothing to look at. And all this shouting and so on is that he imagines a gaze in the closet. He, it is absolutely clear that what he does there is he performs something for an imagined gaze to convince the big other, the authority, that, my God, I am a marshal, I can and, do and it. the funniness is... The it, funniness, it, it, ah, this ah, is the beauty. Yeah. It's the superego funniness, in what sense? You know, the first thing, if you know, and you do, David Lynch movies, First, the first thing to do is to put uh, Dennis Hopper here, Jack, or I even forgot, it, in the series with other David Lynch heroes, who, the more brutal they are, the more they have this funny element. For example, what some people claim it's his worst movie, but I like it, Dune. Dune. The big bad guy, Baron Harkonnen. He is absolutely ridiculously funny, it's clear. Because of excess. Because of excess, yes. Then, uh, another example, from Wild at Heart, Bobby Peru, played by Willem Dafoe. I, I feel we should show it. Yeah, but just so that I finish maybe, this line. Maybe yeah. I, I want to show it, but I'm not sure right after, after another Lynch. Maybe Whatever we will show okay, it in a okay. while. But just another example then. Uh, did you see Lost Highway? There, again, this excessive figure of male authority played by Robert Loggia, the gangster boss. There is a wonderful moment of this excessive superego which becomes funny. The driving. The, the driving, and then they hit or some car, and then he stops that guy, 
and brutally starts to shout at him, don't you know the fucking rules? If you drive like this, uh, you're people... Going, you're going over speed limit. Over it's speed. Crazy, Is yeah. this a wonderful moment, I mean, of this, this excess? So I, uh, what strikes me is that it's put in a funny way, but I agreed with the guy there. <laughs> he was right. Okay, but what I want to say, so we have the second... But, but so, so in, in fact, the funniness comes also from the tension between what we're seeing which is brutally horrible, and that the extreme, nearly performative, brutally um, unrestrained quality of yeah, Jack. But, but this extreme quality, now allow me a line of thought, which is, I think, crucial, is always already staged. I am now, so, I so will it, explain it, it, it to you. I will now engage in a brief Digression, as you like to put it, no? Uh, I, you know, I, 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 yeah, I, I think it, it that... It may not be brief, but yeah, digression. Yeah, yeah. I think that precisely when we appear to be spontaneous, in the sense of, like, I have enough of it, I start to swear or whatever, these excessive moments, then we act. You have to learn that. There is nothing spontaneous in it. This idea was given to me with my, by my Austrian friend, Robert Faller, who developed this notion of how, look, we have ordinary small pleasures. Like, if you really want to drink something pleasurable, you do milk or fruit juice or whatever. But all the excessive pleasures are first experienced as disgusting and then learned. Think about how probably did you discover alcohol, hard drinks. You were seven, eight, nine, ten when the friend told you, don't you know what adults are drinking? And he gave you some vodka, whiskey, and admit it. First, after you tried it, you said, it's disgusting. Then you learn it. It's, uh, it's the, the same with smoking. You start smoking, you cough. It's this, all these pleasures are learned pleasures. And I claim, ultimately, the same goes with sex. If you want to do it with pleasure, you must, pleasure is masturbating in peace. Anything more is learned. And I'm claiming <laughs> especially swearing. I learned this. I wonder if it's with you the same. Uh, People would have thought we have a polite conversation, and then you have enough of it, of that idiot, maybe you, maybe not, and you start to swear what... No, with me it's the opposite. Precisely when you explode in fury, you follow a formula. It's learned. And, you know, I noticed that with my friends in Slovenia, we developed a ritual to get rid of this. When we met, we first do... 10 minutes of totally ritualized swearing, humiliations, like, fuck off, I will dig your mother up her grave and fuck her in... <laughs> disgusting. And then after 10 minutes of this, we said, okay, we did our duty, now we can talk like kind people what we are. It's like a relief, you know. And I think that Lynch is deeply aware of it. This, what Jack is doing there, this is not a wild outburst, my God. This is... Staged. This is learned staged. And that's the horror about horrible things. There is nothing natural about them. You know, what I have learned among other things, we don't have time to talk about it, but I want to express my deep respect for it, among other great things that this country produced, uh, Joshua Oppenheimer, you know, the documentaries that acts of killing, whatever. That's the lesson that for them, the Indonesian right-wing uh, uh, murderers. To do it, they had to act. They had to identify with Hollywood, uh, uh, with Humphrey Bogart, Old Noir, and so on and so on. No, all these wild outbursts, you act. You know, um, since you were mentioning uh, Danish thinkers and you were mentioning Kierkegaard before, there's a line of Kierkegaard that I've always loved, where he said that the goal is to arrive at immediacy after reflection. Yeah, yeah. Although one has to be here, but you wouldn't believe that because you don't Why think. Not? Hegel. Well, here I think well, the only you, problem I have. Do you? Because in in a way, I, 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 do you believe in such a thing as an immediacy? Uh, if we're if we're, uh, now, if, if, if we're if we're staged, please, if we're please. staged, you are talking with a Hegelian. As a Hegelian, I can prove anything to okay. you. Okay. So um, yes, uh, yes, I believe, and I will okay. tell you how Hegel knew this. This is why Hegel was for monarchy. 
Hegel knew that in order to have a state of mediation, everybody works, constructs himself, you have to have an idiot on the top, who is, think is for Hegel an idiot, who is directly what he is by birth. He doesn't need any, any, uh, any mediation. And what Hegel knew, again, in a very Kierkegaardian way, is that you can sustain all the edifice of mediation, but you need in, like what Lacan calls le point de capiton, quilting point. Of, you need an immediacy, which this is, is not... This is a, the, the, the moment to ask you what... I mean, since we are going to be speaking and are already in some way speaking about our identities, what, what is, in, in an age of digital identity, a person? I, I always had a problem with persons, because I think that person should be opposed to subject. Person is, for me, maybe I'm wrong, this inner wealth of, you know, all the fears, your dreams, blah, blah, all that bullshit. Subject is something much more terrifying. Subject is a void. Person is here to mask the subject. I don't, I think person is an excuse not to be subject. But okay, this is okay. another point. But I know what you want to say. And I don't know what I want to say. Yeah, but I know. That's why I know it. Okay, I said okay. I know. <laughs> okay. I didn't say that you yes. know. Of course you don't know. <laughs> Who it's obvious. You know? I mean, yeah. I, uh, no, no, it's obvious. But <laughs> since we were talking about um, inter indeterminacy, and yeah. you, you, you took to task Hannah Arendt, I want to show a passage that you want to see from Casablanca. And have you ah, and have watch you it and very, very carefully. carefully now one of the advantages of these passages as compared to the one you saw before is they're very short. One minute. So if we could watch number two, please. Go ahead and shoot. You'll be doing me a favor. Stay away. I thought I would never see you again. That you are out of my life. The day you left Paris, if you knew what I went through, if you knew how much I loved you, how much I still love you. Oh, oh, oh. It's, uh the clip, the way you sent it to yes. me, it was five seconds. Okay, but we can discuss no, 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 it. No, 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 it's not a problem. Was it turned off before? Discuss it. Okay, but let's go I, on. It's not yeah. a problem. Just to describe to you what happens then. We pass to the Casablanca Airport Tower. We see it for three and a half seconds, and then we return to Rick's, to Humphrey Bogart's room, where he stands close to the door, and the same conversation seems to go on. That was the point. Now, why I like immensely this scene? Because in its very simplicity, uh, essays were written on it, it uh, demonstrates the role of censorship, what can be seen, what, cannot, what should not be seen, how they interact, and in this sense, how ideology functions in Hollywood. Namely, when you see also uh, 10 seconds yeah. more, one big question arises, if you are a normal human person. Did they do it or not? That is to say, are we really doing just with three seconds and a half of a blackout, and then the same conversation goes on? Or do these three seconds and a half of a Tower stand for 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever you want, of intense sex. And here is the genius of the film. And the tower is also in yeah, stupid yeah. phallic symbol, yeah. yes. So we have a whole series of signs 
that it did happen. First, in classical Hollywood, where direct mention of sex was prohibited, you know that it was extremely codified, like how you hinted at it. For example, in classical Hollywood, my God, Hays Code censorship was absolutely at the same level as Stalinist censorship, sometimes even worse. For example, homosexuality was not permitted, even to mention it. But the way they did it is when a guy enters a room and somebody says, hmm, you have a perfume, what perfume do you wear? Did you put on you? This means homosexuality. Or prostitution was prohibited to mention directly, even as a topic. But when, this is very funny, dirty for me, when somebody says, that woman comes from New Orleans, this was the code for, she is a prostitute. <laughs> so, uh, along these lines, when a couple passionately embraces, and then you have fade out, especially if what follows is this type of obvious symbol, phallic tower, it means sex. Another thing, after we return to them, the, the they are smoking. The, they are smoking, which is... Which is also standard. When you see a couple after a fade out, smoking a cigarette, it means they did it before. So we have, then we have another line making it clear that they didn't do it. For example, the same conversation seems to go on. They are fully dressed, blah, blah. The and be, the, way, the, be, the bed is made. Yeah, yeah. And then, the, so the way we should read it, I think, is imagine some authority telling you, we will first present you a scene so that you can claim innocence. I didn't do anything sinful I can claim in the eyes of some moral authority that nothing happened, they just talk. But at the same time, as if, after you can claim your innocence in the eyes of some moral authority, at the same time, we will give you a whole series of hints for your dirty imagination and so on. They lit, it is as if they offer you double identification. But they offer you also the possibility of being a, a less, or, less or more sophisticated reader. Yeah, but, but I think now comes my point of critique of ideology, but I think that the ideal viewer is not a pure one who doesn't see. It's precisely the one who plays on both levels. On ambivalence. I mean, let me give you another example, very short. There is a wonderful dialogue I quoted between Joseph Sternberg, you know, the Berlin Dietrich director, and uh, one of the, I forgot who he was, the main guy of Hayes Code, uh, Breen, I think, yeah. Joseph Breen. And uh, 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 Joseph Brin is asking Sternberg, they're going through the scenario for a film, to make it clear, like, in scenario, it just says they withdraw to a stack of, uh, how do you call it, uh, dry grass, hay or whatever, and lie down. And Brin asks him, Sternberg, what does this mean? Do they fuck or not? And then uh, uh, Sternberg says, oh, it's not clear, it's poetry. And Joseph Breen, the censor, please tell me clearly, if they fuck, we will do it. The way our censorship demands, but we'll make it absolutely clear that they do. Everything was clear. So what interests me is that, this is my big lesson, ideology is not only this superficial line, you know, like, ooh, nothing happened, and then in a subversive way you get the other message. No, institutions also need, our society needs also this obscene other side. Ideology is not, not just the public text. Ideology is the public text and its obscene underside, which is even more forceful if it remains unspoken. Because you know that an author, I forgot him, wrote a short story, I forgot his name, uh, 20 pages Give about me. this scene. You know um, what? Um, um, Mol Moltby, no. No, Moltby wrote no, a, text a, a text on it, theoretical, but yeah. he wrote a short story about, it's like this, it describes Casablanca up to this point, you know, uh, Marlene, uh, sorry, uh, Ingrid Bergman comes up, they embrace, and then at the end, 
we are where we are. They start to talk again. But in between, you have 15 pages of extremely explicit sexuality. They do everything and so on. But I think this doesn't work. There are even some nice details there. But, so, he, so, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 sorry. What I mean is that he reconstructual, you know, these famous lines from Casablanca, like one of them is Humphrey Bogart telling to her, I think, here's one to you, kid. No? You know what happens in this story? He pulls out his penis and pushes his towards her mouth and then here is one to you, kid, and so on. It's incredible. But what I want, I don't celebrate this. I think if you put it out in this way, you lose the effort. So, so in, 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 in some way in, in our world mm -hmm. now, we're putting it out. Is that, is yeah, that... but I don't like this. I, I don't like this. I think that then you get in some kind of a apparently sexualized but really very sterile universe, you know. I don't believe in putting it out all. No, I know. Yeah, I'm a conservative here, like... You know what I mean? No, no, but I know what you mean. Yeah. But um, let's get at what you mean. I mean, pla places such as... Let's take for an example... What no, let's want take for an example yeah. Facebook, where you have to choose between different genders, between different, you know, ja you and I have spoken a little bit about Jaren Lanier and his critique yeah. of that. There's a problem with the notion that we have to in some way identify. Yeah. We, we have to yeah. exclude. Okay. We can't have different ambivalent meanings in the same way. Yeah, but, in, uh, okay, what interests me, if you ask me, in phenomena, not only Facebook, but generally this, let's call them staged identities, you know, like where you can invent a fake identity. I can be a straight man and I can construct my, my digital web persona, which is that of a promiscuous woman, of a gay person, whatever. The thing, it's obvious what I will say, the thing that interests me is how there can be more truth in the mask that you adopt than in your real inner self. I always believe in masks. I don't, if you tear, I never believed in emancipatory potential of this gesture, let's tear off the masks. Okay, let me so give you a keep, simple... keep the persona. Yeah, but why? Let me give you a simple example. Let us say that I am in reality a shy, impotent, stupid person, afraid, but then in internet interaction, I adopt a screen persona of a brutal rapist guy who humiliates people, beats women, and so on. It's too easy to say, oh, I'm really a coward, but there I imagine to be a powerful macho. What if it's the opposite? What if I really am that, a brutal guy, but in real life, because of social pressure and so on, I oppress it, so that the true mask is my authentic, real self. And truth, the truth comes out precisely in the guise of a fiction, which is why I like very much old-fashioned novels like Is It Mansfield Park or which Jane Austen, you know, this classical topos that there are a group of people, some of their lovers, who are too shy to act upon their love, but then, for example, if they're upper class, they decide to stage a play, and as if by a miracle, the roles that, are, that they play there allows them to say on stage to the person they love that in real love they cannot say, and so on and so I mean, on. Th this is a very Nietzschean move of you, no? The notion that our truth is really the mask we put on. Yeah, although, okay, that's another topic, my problems with Nietzsche and so on, you know. But yes, I, I, I believe in this, I believe here in alienation. I'm in alienation in the sense of, again, you need an external point of identification. The truth is out there, but not because we have to avoid our true inner self. Our true inner self is full of shit. It's misery, whatever. I never believed in, you know, getting deep into a person. 
If I go deep into anyone, I discover shit. We are all filthy, egotists, whatever. It doesn't interest me. I, so I, how, so uh, approaching them in what way then to get to them? Uh, again, what fascinating... I mean, is that, is that the wrong way of approaching? Yeah, because, you know, when you say approaching, you presuppose that people themselves are what they are. I don't think people are persons in the sense of they hear something. So you're truth. answering the other question about yeah. the person. In a way, yes, that people are not persons in the sense that there is some inner truth, their dreams, whatever, that makes the real core of a person. And I will give you an ultimate answer, which I hope will convince you now. I mean in an absolutely sincere way for a moment, if you can. Forget my tasteless jokes. You know Jonathan Little's Le Bien Veillant, yeah. the novel? Yeah. Uh, I think what he did there is precisely, in a way, making the point that, I like, that you know, uh, when you, what always bothers me is this disgusting, again, wisdom, ah, like, I'm ready to shoot people who claim there was a so-called multicultural wisdom, which says an enemy is a person whose inner story we don't know. The idea is clear. We hate someone, but if we were to know his universe from within, we would have seen he also has his side of the story, his experience to tell. Maybe, maybe, but the truth of this is extremely limited, I think. Because what I always fascinated me is how, if you take even the greatest criminals, Hitler, Stalin, whatever, murderers. I'm quite sure that each of them will be able to tell you a very authentic inner story and so on. I think that our inner truth, when you really open up yourself, you know, this pathetic moment, this is what I am, these are my dreams, my deepest fears, desires, then you really lie. In the case of Nazis and so on, you have this deep inner story to avoid confronting the horror of what you are doing. I don't, I think if some Nazi executioner will start to tell you about his inner experience, I would say, I'm not, your truth is outside. Your truth is, truth is what you did there in the camp. I'm not interested in your inner story. Besides, this is the basic Lacanian notion of fantasy as a constitutive lie. I want our inner truth is, the lie we construct to be able to live with the misery of our actual lives. Um, I, I'd like to address you now with this notion that you have of pseudo-activity. Uh, yeah. you, you say, you write that the danger is not passivity, but pseudo-activity. To what extent do you think the internet provides a perfect forum in which to engage in this form of pseudo-activity? That's a good point, because what I want to... Again, you are not totally stupid, as I said already yesterday. You, you, well, you, you said that yesterday, and I tried to keep that true today. Okay. No, quite seriously. What I, I think we should not understand what you just said, and I'm not saying you do. We both agree here. In this obvious sense that you know, instead of really making love or whatever, we dream about it on the net and so on. It's not as simple as that, that internet is a medium where we just pretend to be active. No, uh, it can be much more paradoxical. Real life, real activity can also be even more a pseudo activity. You know, here, although I am not such a great admirer of Stanley Kubrick, but there is a nice detail from the very end of his uh, eyes wide shut, or what. You remember, after they get lost in these right. fantasy dreams, yes, at the very end of the film, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman met, I think, in some department store, and does she tell him or he her it doesn't matter, something like, listen, we have to do something, we, we have to go home and fuck quickly. I think this is an escape from the real. The lesson is not, we were caught in all that dreaming because we didn't have enough real activity, sex. No. The lesson is that all those crazy dreams about which the film is confronted them with this excessive real of their passion. And sex would be there applied 
precisely to avoid that trauma. The, their dreams were more traumatic, more real than the real activity. And I think this is how ideology really works, where you don't escape into fantasy in order to avoid doing it really. No, you construct your real activity itself as an escape. An example that I always use, I'm sorry if I'm repetitive, Charity activity. We like to, do, like to do it, you know. Oh my God, children starving in Africa. I give five euros per month, whatever, to help. I think that all, for me, the ultimate pseudo activity, um, ecology. So this personalized. We need to save the, the planet. No, that's okay. Maybe, although I'm more on tri from Trier's side, melancholia, but maybe we should save the planet. But what I mean is that this. Pseudo-personalized ecology, which makes you personally responsible, and then they say, okay, but what did you do about it? And then the ideology has an answer to you. Did you, did you, did you put together uh, for, uh, for recycling all the newspapers? Did you separate all Coca-Cola cans and so on? As if you know, you do these small things and you did your duty. This, I think, is an absolute example of pseudo-activity. This is offered to us so that we don't have to think about it and really to do something. Then you can say to her, okay, I separated my coke cans, I did the cans, I did put uh, newspapers aside, okay, I did my duty towards the Mother Earth, and now I can have my co go on without changing anything. This would be an example and belief of pseudo-activity, because you can believe me, I know what is pseudo-activity because I embody it. I am, everybody who watches me more than five minutes knows, I'm a perfect obsessional neurotic. And this is what obsessional neurotics are doing. They are hyperactive all the time, not in order to achieve something, but in order to prevent that something would happen. For example, do, you can imagine... Do, do, do you think that... Um, your, your delivery, your talking yes. as powerfully, powerfully and as intensely, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, is, is a way of avoiding? Yeah, at some level, I believe. So, no, so, let, so, let me so, give no, you an no, example. No. So, yeah. so, in fact, when you're, when you're talking so intensely with me now and delivering mm. these beliefs, you, mm. you, you, mm. you don't remain silent because it might reveal something the silence. Okay, now you are too deep for me. I don't like to analyze myself. <laughs> but what I want to say is, I clearly remember when I was 30 years ago but in analysis. Some, but there could be some truth to what I'm yeah, saying. So what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. No, sorry. What I want to say is that when I was in psychoanalysis, I clearly remember for just a couple of months that I got tired of it. As you can imagine, I talked all the time. You know why? Because I was afraid that if I stop talking, the analyst may ask me a really unpleasant question. <laughs> you know, which would really yes. touch something in me. So I talked all the time just to keep him quiet. And then he said, okay, for today we are finished, fuck off, perfect, I go. You know, this is pseudo-activity. And I think today, even politically, we are full of pseudo-activities. We do things so, so what, not in yeah. order really to change something, but just to make it sure that nothing will change. <laughs> Which is why I think that sometimes the truly subversive thing is to do nothing. You know, because by doing nothing, you make people feel, feel what through all their hyperactivity they are uh, covering do, do, up. Do you think the internet does that to some extent? I mean, in, 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 no, but in, not necessarily. In, but in a, in a sense, for instance, I know you've written about porn and the internet. And so, in a sense, watching porn on the internet and watching porn, we don't do anything. Yeah, but it, uh, here things are more complicated. First, I think the lesson of so-called virtual sex, it's a much more tragic one. It's not this humanist idea, there was some good old time when sex were authentic, encounter with a real flesh and blood person, and now we are just doing... It. No, what we learn through virtual sex is that sex in a way always was virtual. Virtual in the sense that I already described it, yeah. that precisely 
how should I put it? Lacan, Jacques Lacan says somewhere, I think, that uh, real sex, uh, that uh, sex has a structure of masturbation. In the sense that, as I said already before, you are never alone with your partner. You need a fantasy. It may be even the fantasy about this partner, you know, a certain detail, how she smiles, what to do, blah, blah. And you basically use the partner as a kind of a masturbatory tool to enact your fantasy. It's never, you are never just alone with the partner. So this is the Lacanian twist. We, how do we usually describe masturbation? As doing it, but just with an imagined partner. You do it to yourself, you imagine well, you, you know the, the, But I think you, you real know, sex... You know the Woody Allen line that masturbating is making love to someone I love really dearly. Yeah, which is your fantasy image of your... Yeah, yeah. Because, again, if this is masturbation, uh, doing it to yourself, but with an imagined partner, Lacan, Lacan's reply would have been that real sex is just masturbation with the real partner, you know. And I think, now we come to pseudo-activity and all that. I did, a year ago, a Guardian asked me some stupid question about is there still passion today, how to revive sex, and I there gave the only possible formula of authentic love. My idea was this one, I'm sorry if you know the joke. Uh, you know how today we have not only dildos, that is to say, plastic penises, we also already have mechanic uh, vaginas. They are called, where I read a strange name, I love it, uh, 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 stimulating training unit, something, it's horrible. It looked like a battery, and then you take the top off, and it has the entrance, and then you can even uh, uh, replace entrance with something which looks like vaginal openings, anal opening, or mouth. Then you can regulate the density, how it shakes, and so on. So my idea for authentic sex today was this one. It answers, I think, your question about uh, pseudo-activity, blah, blah. Let's say I make a date with a lady. We are all serious people who would do that. Naked, you are there mingling on bed, that's not for decent people. You do this. She brings her dildo, I bring my vagina. We put both machines on, we put dildo into vagina, and we just listen to the buzzing, and let's say you are my lady, and then we drink tea, we have a nice conversation, and they are doing the business for us, you know. But now comes my miracle. Our duty to enjoy is covered there. And maybe, if you are a lady, maybe, just maybe, while we are just talking and the machines are doing the superego job of enjoying for us, our hands touch, we embrace, and that would have been the true sex, you know. Not the, not the superego duty, you have to do it there. Because I must say it's tempting. Sorry? <laughs> Yeah, but if we do it, machines will only do it. With you, no hand touching, you know. <laughs> I warn you. Um, no, sorry, another story along the same lines so that I explain it to them. Because, you know, the lesson of psychoanalysis is often here the opposite one. It's not that, you know, usually people think the lesson of psychoanalysis is whatever you do, you think about that, you know. It's all about sex. No, it's much more tragic. My friend, the British Lacanian psychoanalyst Darian Leader, told me a wonderful story that happened to him with a patient. A patient told him how once he wanted to seduce a lady, so he took her to a hotel which had a restaurant down there. The idea was first to invite her for a dinner, and then, of course, afterwards to take her up to the room. But he made a Freudian sleep. When they entered the restaurant, instead of saying, a table for two, please, he said to the waiter, a bed for two, please. Now comes uh, the true Lacanian spirit of Darian Leader. He says, we absolutely should not read this as a kind of a pleasurable precipitation. Who cares about eating? I really want just to sleep with her. He said, it's the opposite. He was afraid that he will enjoy eating more than sex, so that, you know, he will forget about the official excuse. So this bed 
for two was rather a reminder, wait a minute, I should not forget what's my real aim, I must not to take too much pleasure in. That, because this is the problem today, I claim. Today, our, the structure even of sexual life is more and more this perverse one, because this is the definition of perversion. You take one of these first steps and you forget about the big act, you just, you just do this, no? So, uh, in a way, let me just, another short digression. The tragedy today with sex, I claim, is that precisely because maybe of our permissivity, it's disappearing. What do I mean here? Did you notice how my good friend Alain Badiou drew my attention to it? Did you notice how we are, in a way, returning to pre-modern times of arranged marriages. Only this time, they are not old wise women, relatives who do it, but dating agencies and so on and so on. And internet dating. Yeah, and you know what happens there? But you found a wonderful formula. In a French agency, dating agency used it in advertisement, and I found the same formula in an American dating agency, namely, you, in your language, do not have this expression, but in English and in French, they have it. You use the verb to fall, to tombe, to, to fall in love. The phrase they use is, use our agency and we will enable you to be in love without the fall. And that's the horror today. Fall means, you know, that's my God, all that love is for me. That uh, traumatic encounter. But, I but, but, but here, here so fall is the traumatic encounter. So, Slavoj, there is a real moment where something can happen. Yeah, but precisely no, 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 all no, no, these days. But, but, no, but, but no, but it can. In other words, yeah, that, there, there is. The, I mean, I'm to, romantic to, here. There is true love, absolutely. And the, there is fall, and there is a yeah. bi the biblical image, and there is a falling down, and falling as failing, and falling as opening. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there is there is such a thing. As, absolutely. I thought there wasn't, though. <laughs> are you a Jew at all? No, I, I but I thought no, 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 no. You are no, a pagan. No, 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 but I thought there wasn't. I said no, truly. No, there I, is I, I, no, but I, I thought that... Yeah, in, but in, wait in a some, minute. No, no, but wait, even intelligent wait, wait. Christians know, Felix Kulpa and so on, that the fall is the greater thing that can happen to humanity, you know. That's but, the whole but, point but, of so the So there Bible. is a moment when actually you do encounter the other. Yes, absolutely. No, I'm and, not but, here, but, the but, stupid postmodernist, you but know. But you also, you also encounter them not only through falling, but through a habit of going back and back and getting to know them better. No, this no. I doubt. Wait a minute, yeah, yeah, you so had you an interview with Adam Phillips yes, I where did. the two of you made this point very clear. The falsity of this self-knowledge and so on and so on. Fall happens without self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is a big escape for me from the real of an encounter. So, um, no, but uh, sorry, just to uh, f finish this point. You know then where I saw the confirmation of this, and it makes me very sad, I'm a romantic here. Did you notice something weird in the lowest popular culture? Did you notice that, for example, Quantum of Solace, which is otherwise a good James Bond, politically progressive, to cut a long story short, James Bond there uh, saves a Morales regime in Bolivia from right-wing coup. But did you notice it's the first James Bond in which, at the end, there is no sex between Bond and Bond girl? It's just, they embrace and, oh, they are too traumatized. Then, let's go even much lower. Dan Brown. Did you notice how in his Da Vinci Code, no sex between Langdon and Sophie, the grand, grand, grand daughter of Christ. In Angels and Demons, things are even worse. There, there is sex in the novel, but not in the movie. Where are we coming? In the good old days, Hollywood was adding sex to commercialize the story. Now Hollywood is deleting sex. And I think the lesson is very sad. We live in time where you are called to enjoy, but you know, the joke that I always repeat, a controlled, safe enjoyment, safe sex, you know, like, or, like, do it, but carefully, don't be excessive, and so on. I think that today, 
more and more a passionate love attachment where, you know, real madness, like you are madly in love, you are ready to risk anything for it, is considered pathological. I mean, what society is telling us today, it's some kind of an experimental half-Buddhist hedonism. Change your life, experiment, an adventure here, an adventure there, but don't take too seriously your attachment, remain free, and so on. This is the cheap pseudo-Buddhism that we get. You know, this is how our hedonism, no wonder Richard Geert is a Tibetan Buddhist, we uh, uh, apply to it this Buddhist wisdom, don't get too attached to worldly objects. No, what, you, what you're saying is get attached. Totally. Absolutely to get the end. Totally attached. Totally attached. Fall. Fall to the end. Before we, before we conclude and fall totally, I want to mention something to you. I want to read a yeah, quote. But you will fall deeper. You know what's my joke with him? When we will be both in hell, yeah. I will be only in the boiling oil up to here. You know why? Because I will be standing on his arms, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, English novelist. Uh, Which one? Jonathan Coe. Uh, wrote in the London Review of Books about political satire and how it may be doing more harm than good. This is what he writes. These days, every politician is a laughing stock, and the laughter which occasionally used to illuminate the dark corners of the political world with dazzling, unexpected shafts of hilarity has become an unthinking reflex on our part a tired Pavlovian reaction to situations that are too difficult or too depressing to think about clearly. Boris Johnson, a conservative mayor of London, seems to know this. He seems to know that the laughter that surrounds him is a substitute for thought rather than its conduit, and that puts him at a wonderful advantage. If we are chuckling at him, we are not likely to be thinking too hard about his doggedly neoliberal and pro-city agenda, let alone doing anything to counter it. With a true genius for taking <coughs> the temperature of a country that has never been closer to sinking temperature, sniggering beneath the watery main, Boris Johnson has become his own satirist, safe above all in the knowledge that the best way to make sure the satire aimed at you is gentle and unchallenging is to create it yourself. Do you agree with this? Absolutely. And I will tell you why. First, one first line of associations is that I remember when I was much younger, I remember when Umberto Eco published his Name of the Rose. In ex-Yugoslavia, this was still, we immediately got engaged in a tremendous debate, and me and my friends were absolutely opposed to the novel in the sense of, you know, the basic idea, laughter is liberating. No, totalitarian power also laughs. Uh, so, uh, generally, I'm opposed to this idea Power is dignified when you mock it, you are doing something subversive. Maybe, maybe not, as yeah. This guy says quite often uh, uh, laughter functions as the best way to neutralize effective reflection, criticism. You know who knew this also very well? Communist regimes. There was a rumor, which is unfortunately a wrong one, but it indicates a deep truth. In Russian friends tell me that even in Russia, in Yugoslavia, there was this rumor that secret police had a special sub-department whose task was only to produce political jokes, and they were then put into circulation, you know, to give ordinary people simple means to laugh and to prevent them. I don't think this was happening. I know people were even put to prison for it, but I nonetheless claim that political jokes in communist countries had followed this logic. They, there was nothing subversive does, does in any, them. Does any of this happen to you? Um, that in some way people... Well, a different I, way... Absolutely. Do you know I, what I, I mean? Always, in other I words... Know, in I know. other words I know, because there people, are people, people who, could... Uh, 
people who, who write for big American uh, uh, weeklies, like The New Yorker. People can characterize you in a certain mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. can consider you to be a buffoon, to con yeah, can, yeah, can consider yeah. you... To, All the time, yeah. So how, 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 do you, how do you reconcile yourself okay. or not? Partially, I with, must say, maybe I am co-responsible for it. But basically, I think this is a defense against me in the sense that, you know, this standard line, oh, go to Zizek's talk, he's amusing, he's a little bit crazy, don't take it too seriously. And, and, and so they don't take it. So the, in, yeah, that's in, in the effect, point. Yeah. The, the point yeah. is that the, the, the jokes you tell, which are many, yeah. can make us laugh the yeah, message But, but I off. nonetheless accept no, no, the no, game. You know why? I, well, you, you not accept it, you, you no. make it. Yeah. You know why? Because I nonetheless think that this logic doesn't work. Like, at the same time, they cannot swallow my jokes, you know. I was already interrupted, accused of political incorrectness and so on. But now there is a new line, best epitomized by that crazy attack on me in, in uh, the New Republic, uh, Adam Kirsch. The title says everything, deadly jester. The idea is, superficially, he is a buffoon. But be careful, beneath it there is a deadly totalitarian, anti-Semitic, Stalinist, whatever you want, the message. No? So now there is a new dogma on me, you know, it's no longer he is a buffoon, but you, uh, the buffoon is a mask of something even more dangerous, deadly, and so on. So, what can be done? <laughs> Nothing, read my books. <laughs> I'm very naive here, read my books. I put... Work, you know, I, you know the, but they can be read much like the Casablanca uh, passage in so many different ways so that you can be... I don't really... Can, no, but you can be accused of anti-Semitism, you can be accused of all, all kinds of things that... Yeah, but here I'm very naive, you know, in the sense that, no, I really think that I put my argumentation straight in that if you read me in a minimally honest way, by honest I don't mean anything mystical, but just simply, attentively, that it's absolutely impossible to accuse me of... Uh, look, look, let's take the royal example of it. I love it. Uh, my Welcome to the Jerusalem of the Real, the September 11 book, was translated in Israel and also in Egypt. I knew what, what friends from both countries told me. I love this. The same book, so you can't say I write from one people like this, for other people the opposite. The same book, Jerusalem Post or some that attacked it as, as brutal open anti-Semitism and Al-Ahram attacked it as the most perfidious Zionist propaganda. If this happens, so, maybe I'm doing something right, I claim. No, and, and it reminds me, you know, of that wonderful line of Rilke where he says that fame is but the collection of misunderstandings that gather around a new name. But as, yes, I agree, but as uh, your great guy, Kierkegaard, knew it, no? You cannot, you should not play the pseudo-authenticity here and simply say, fuck fame, this is what I really am. Kierkegaard was deeply, deeply aware of how you need a certain persona, maybe even a ridiculous public mask. Didn't he, I read in a biography of Kierkegaard, like, he said, it's crucial for me to show myself when I'm here almost every evening in theater, to go to certain, you know, he was well, well aware of this. So I'm, I'm ready to, to, assume, to assume this risk. You know, we had about six or seven clips we wanted to show. And um, we can do a quickie, just shall, one. Shall we, shall we do one? Let's do the painful one, my God. Let's stay with Lynch. We don't have time to he for, for uh, Hitchcock. Uh, let's do uh, uh, number seven, Wild at Heart. Seven. Don't jump back so slow. I thought you was a bunny. Bunny jumped fast. You jump back slow. Ain't something, don't it? Means something to me. 
means you want Bobby Peru. You want Bobby Peru to fuck you hard, baby. Open your luck like a Christmas present. You want me to do it? Just a simple yes or no. Just feel me breathing on you. And you know I mean business when it comes to fucking. Get out! Bobby Peru. Grab you. Hold you tight. Feel everything inside, yeah? Be quiet. Say fuck me. And I'll be. No way, get out! Stop it! I'll tear your fucking heart out, girl! Say fuck me. Say fuck me. And then I'll leave. Say fuck me. Whisper it. Say it. Say it. Say it. Say fuck me. Whisper. Fuck me. Fuck me. Say fuck me. Fuck me. Fuck me. Fuck me. Someday, honey, I will. But I gotta get going. Sing. Don't cry. Goodness. Yeah. You know why I was fascinated by this scene when I... I think it's one of the ultimate David Lynch scenes. Because in a way, it describes so nicely the terrifying logic of humiliation. The point is that in a way, to put it in a simplified way, but very brutally. In a way, at psychological level, of course, him not raping her or making love, makes it even worse. The humiliation is even worse, you know. And uh, I think what I developed from this scene in many of my books is how the, the paradoxes of rape and forced sex and so on, the, that I had certain data that my friends told me from Bosnian war when I saw this scene, and you may find shocking it, namely, Okay, let me formulate it in the most abstract way. Imagine two women. One of them is assertive, autonomous, strong person. The, the other one is very passive. Maybe even, why not, dreaming about being mishandled, brutally treated in sex. And imagine both of them are raped. I claim, and this is what sexual researchers into rapes confirmed to me, that the first one, assertive and so on, would get over it much more easily than the second one, although the second one, although in the case of the second one, you can claim, but in some sense, she got what she wanted. Let's say, why not? She really dreamt about being brutally mishandled, and she got that. Now, you know what I'm trying to do here? Do, not the disgusting thing of claiming, oh, so those machos are right, women sometimes really want it. I claim that if you dream about something intimately, the most terrifying thing that can happen to you is to get it in reality. This is the alt, this, uh, uh, how should I put it, complicity of your fantasy that is aroused by it. This makes the pain unbearable. This second woman who secretly dreamed, let's say, of being brutally mishandled and then is really raped, 
C is much more than the autonomous one in danger of maybe even killing herself afterwards. Precisely on account of this shame that... So what my conclusion from this, again, don't be afraid, is, is no, it's that if that not only is this male chauvinist argument, but she secretly wanted it. Not only it's not true, but if anything, it makes things even worse. What strikes me also yes. is that film serves you to think about politics and philosophy around the world. A scene, a, yes. But a scene like that. But it's a tremendous scene, I think. It's, you know, this is David Lynch's genius at its best. This idea, I was shocked of then, you know, oh, honey, not today, thanks for the offer, and so on, you know. It shocked you. It shocked me because of because, again, of the sense of utter humiliation and so on and so on, it's a terrifying... That's my point. It's, in a way, at level of psychological, interpersonal uh, uh, action, it's, in a way, that's my point. And well, it's, it's, a bad it's, in a way, in some way, I'm not downplaying real rape, my God, but it's, in some way, even worse than real rape. That's my paradox. Because it's utter abandonment. Yeah, but precisely at the point when she opens minimally, she treats it as, oh, okay, you offered yourself. You know, this shift in his discourse, I hate this word, when... Sorry, yes, when he says this, uh, oh, thanks, this is the most humiliating point. This is utter humiliation. Slavoj, in closing, a quotation from Peter Sloterdijk. Um, he's on the dangers of globalization. He says, more communication means at first, above all, more conflict. Absolutely agree with him. Personally, although, I mean, he's a right-winger, but I have very good relations with him. You know, in one sense, I agree with it. I'm sick and tired of this politically correct uh, idea of we should understand other cultures, not to condemn them, blah, blah. No, other cultures are boring to me. I don't want to understand them. And you cannot ever do it. This is, again, an endless superego logic. How do we know that when an Arab says God, he means the same things as we do, and so on, and then we are endlessly guilty, and so on? No, the art of true, in good sense now, multiculturalism, is precisely how to coexist when we don't understand each other. I don't want to understand everyone else. And why not? For one good Freudian reason, that I suspect that they don't understand themselves, you know. It's not that if you really go deep into another culture, you will discover some secret or whatever. I don't believe in this. I think cultures are cheating, inconsistent, and so on. I, I think that, you know, true, again, true multiculturalism with me is not. You live in an apartment where a Jew is upside, an Arab downside, an Italian to the left, or a Chinese to the right, and then you all tell each other ethnic stories and at the end understand each other. That's a nightmare. I want to live in a building, I love to live with foreigners, where you precisely remain at the level of superficial politeness. But you were also telling me... <laughs> but I you, don't want but to you were also that. telling me that one of your worries is that there's less and less ethnic jokes told. Absolutely. I think they're one of the most progressive things there are here. Ah, but what kind of ethnic jokes? Wait a minute. Of course, I am... Maybe you don't believe me. I'm not a racist. It's just my personal memory from my past. The great role that ethnic jokes played in old Yugoslavia. They, were, they didn't function in a racist way, but a kind of a friendly competition. I meet a Montenegro or Serb friend, and, okay, you have first this official contact, where it's all the bullshit of understanding. What a wonderful folkloric dances you have, or what interesting food you have. And then I always say, fuck off, tell me a dirty joke, we will be friends. And then there was a high art of competition in ex-Yugoslavia. We were not telling primarily joke about, jokes about others, but jokes about ourselves. So that each nation in ex-Yugoslavia was, in a racist way, of course, identified with the certain features. We Slovene were misers, avar, thrifty. Uh, 
Uh, Bosnians were a little bit sexually obsessed. Uh, uh, Montenegro were lazy. Macedonians were cheating, thieves, and so on. And the whole point was to tell a joke mocking yourself. And the competition was who will tell a nastiest joke about yourself. And it, it, it functioned in a marvelous way. And again, as I always repeat, my negative proof of the positive function of these jokes is that when in early 80s, starting with the early 1980s, uh, ethnic tensions really started to explode in ex-Yugoslavia, these jokes disappeared. Because again, they really... And this is how, this is how I function all the time. I mean, for example, when I meet my Jewish friends, they tell me jokes about the Jews, I tell them jokes from Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, and this is, how, this is how we are best friends. And that's, for me, the best of Jewish culture. Like, can you imagine anything more sublime than the joke that my friend Udi Aloni recently told me that uh, an old, no, not old, but a tired Jew comes home after work and says to his wife, listen, darling, I want some sex to relax, but I'm too tired to do it now. Could you please suck me, Felicio, and swallow it? This would really relax me. The wife said, you know, darling, I'm also tired, so let's do it like this. You masturbate, you finish in a glass, and I will drink it in the morning when I will be... <laughs> Sorry, I like that. This is civilization for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, roses again. <laughs>